Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. And Shaq, uh, it's going down this Sunday, UFC STL, Duho Choi versus Jeremy Stevens, the first event of 2018. Uh, let's do this shit, man. Yeah, man. Anytime Jeremy Stevens fights, I tune in. Anytime Duho fights, I tune in. I'm pumped up for this card. You know, we did uh, launch our new website, maxbestseason.com. And uh, we got some good things going on over there. And I know you guys are anticipating the results. A hundred percent they are. It's funny. We got a couple comments that, oh, now that we launched the new website, now they're going to beat around the bush on their picks. Now they're going to pick one side, but then pick the other side. Well, if you motherfuckers really think that, uh... You know, stay Just tuned. Do. Stay tuned. Let's see. Right. Let's see how much we beat around that bush. Because first up, we got Kyung Ho Kang. He's minus three forty-five. The comeback on Guido Canetti is plus two eighty-five. Now, real quick, his name's not Guido. His name is Guido. He's from Argentina. He's making his return after a three-year layoff. But Kyung Ho Kang is coming back after a four-year layoff. What do you think? You know, uh, I think they got this line pretty accurate. You know. Kyung Ho, before his military service, was looking better than he ever had. I mean, from his first two fights with uh, Caceres and Chico, those being close decisions, fights that could have went either way, in my opinion. Yeah, he did some questionable things in those fights, but he was young. He was learning his craft. That's not the type of fighter he was that he showed in the next two fights, especially the Tanaka fight, where at the time Tanaka was supposed to be the next big thing out of Asia. And Kyung Ho went in there and handled him. Handled him on the mat, handled him on the feet, and showed the improvements he was making in his game. Now, Guido Canetti, he's one of these these fighters where, you know, he's, what, 38, 39? 38, for real. Out of alpha male, you know. He is from Argentina. You know you've heard me in the past. Watch out for the dirty Argentine tactics. <laughs> I have seen Guido... Uh, do some pretty dirty things in there. I saw him. I've seen him punt a, a head against a cage before. I've seen him bite fingers before. <laughs> he's bought fingers before, but you know, we know he's a tough guy. Solid left kick to the body. Solid left kick to to the head. But I mean, his cardio is an issue in my opinion. And I mean, not to mention, I've seen the guy do some questionable things in terms of when he fought H Henry Briones. I mean, the way he tapped. That was one of the fastest taps I've ever seen. And you know, he was hurting Henry bad. But I just think Kyung Ho's on a different level. He's too long. I don't know how the guy makes Bantam weight. Um, I just think when he gets the body lock, he's going to be able to muscle him down consistently and uh, get the win. And if not, beat him on the feet. Yeah, so remember when we gave out that six-unit winner on Mateus Nicolau and everyone was saying, oh, you're betting on a USADA victim and this and that. And we're like, it's not going to matter there. He's 24 years old. Just like Brian T. T. City Ortega when he popped, he was 23. It doesn't matter. Well, you know a situation where it probably will matter, Shaq? Right here with Guido Canetti. Because when you're talking about a 38-year-old, this is where USADA matters. When you talk about guys like Guido Canetti, when you talk about guys like Vitor Belfort, Machida, Anderson. Now, I'm not comparing their careers at all. What I am saying is, you know, when you're in your late 30s, early 40s, and you're popping for steroids, that's when you saw it as a factor. But that being said, man, I've seen the pictures, and this kid is still ripped. And I say kid, he's 38 years old. This old man is still ripped out of his mind. But certain things uh, that physique can't, you know, provide you. Physique can't provide you heart. Physique can't provide you, uh, you know, better fighting skills. Because as we know, Guido Canetti is one of these guys that he's got a very nice left kick and he's an explosive guy, but he doesn't use uh, his cardio management is not on point at all. That's why in the middle of all his fights, you know, four minutes into the first round, he's standing there not doing a fucking thing because, you know, he lets it all. He doesn't know how to manage that gas tank. And now he's been out three years and you're telling me he's going to come back looking better when he didn't even look good four years ago. Now, with Kyung Ho Kang, he did look good four years ago. Four years ago, he was looking like the best version of himself ever when he fought Tanaka, went out there, out-scrambled, the very good scrambler. I mean, T Tanaka's a dude that comes out of that, uh, what, Crazy B camp with with fucking all, the, all those badasses, with Kyoji Horiguchi and all those dudes. This ain't the first Alpha Male guy Kyung Ho's fought, and this one be Wait, like, so was he at Alpha Male or was he at Crazy B? He's got a team Alpha Male Japan. Is, is he there. Crazy B too or no? No, I don't think so. Oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm, just talk, I'm just talking shit then. <laughs> but bottom line, he kind of has that Crazy B style because he does a little bit of that fucking darting in and out, that big, uh, that circling. But bottom line, what I'm trying to get to here, gentlemen, is that Kyung Ho Kang... Uh, He's not going to have issues out scrambling Guido Canetti in this spot. And not only that, his, his striking has gotten a lot calmer, a lot crisper, a lot more technical his last few fights. I know he's been out a long time, but look, he's been training for the last year straight. We know that. He's going to come here in amazing shape. Ring rust might be a real thing, but it's going to be a real thing for his opponent as well. 
Kyung Ho King is just the much better fighter, and I was considering betting it, but now I see minus 345. Look, minus 150 for the four-year layoff? Okay, I'll pay that 50 cents extra juice, but minus 345, you have to pass. My pick is Kyung Ho Kang to get the victory. Now, next up in the strawweight division, JJ Aldrich. She's minus 130. The comeback on Danielle Taylor is plus 110. What are you thinking, Shaq? It's a solid fight, man. Um... You know, Danielle Taylor, you know, the public seems to think that she's been losing these fights, uh, that she's been in these uh, close decisions. Fight with Marina Moroz, who at the time was number eight in the division. Going to a split decision with her, I remember, you know, that right hand that she landed in that second round. Danielle Taylor's a solid girl, comes with a solid game plan for three rounds, um, likes to move around a lot. And J.J. Aldridge, she's a little slick southpaw. If you stand in front of her, if you cut angles and move, then, you know, she tends to have a little bit of trouble. We've seen her lose to JJ, uh, I mean, Jamie Moyle. On, uh, in the first round. In the first round. Um, you know, I'm going to go with Danielle in this one. I just think the movement's going to be too much. I think the high-low action, you know, where she's faking low, coming up with that overhand right, just the movement is going to frustrate her. And she's a stealer. Danielle knows how to steal these rounds. Uh, she's proven it time after time. I think she's more... Her game is more suited to win those three round decisions, and I like I said, I think if you stand in front of JJ Aldridge, then you know things will get a little hairy. But I think Danielle's not on that. I think she's coming to move, cut angles, and win a close decision. So I was actually kind of impressed with JJ Aldridge. You know, I didn't remember having uh, that kind of striking. She's got the hand fighting on point. She throws straight down the pipe. But a big issue for her here is she's going to be significantly slower and much less athletic. Now, I know a lot of people like to bring up, oh, she's got a 7-inch reach advantage. Yeah, tell me what opponent of Danielle Taylor didn't have a 7-inch reach advantage. Danielle is a constant, a consummate winner, a total professional. This isn't anything new for her. Her UFC debut on short notice, she fought a chick with 7 inches of height and reach on her, and she went to a split, landed one of the hardest shots I've ever seen in UFC strawweight history. So the way I think she's going to win this fight is, the issue J.J. Aldrich has is that she's not very good at cutting off that ring. If you stand right in front of her, chances are she's going to pick you apart. Look, she trains with the champ, and you know, you know, training with the champ might not mean shit you know, when you're talking about Alex Chambers training with Joanna, but in this case with J.J. Aldrich, it might mean shit because uh, you know, you've seen her striking. Her striking is on point, but it's only on point when you stand right in front of her. Danielle does not stand right in front of anyone. She circles around the ring. She's going to be significantly more athletic, more dynamic, and a lot more powerful than J.J. Aldrich in this spot. Another thing is, I mean, Daniel Taylor's seen this look before in the Sohee Ham fight. Sohee Ham, in my opinion, had a harder left hand, a, a straighter left hand, and she had better hand fighting than J.J. Aldrich, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, it was a rough first round for Danielle, but in rounds two and three, I mean, she absolutely took over like she always does. And she's a proven, like, you know how we say, in the female fighting game, you need your girls that can go three rounds at an efficient rate, and Danielle Taylor's one of those girls. 100% she is. So, again, it comes down to this. I think Danielle's going to capitalize on JJ's inability to cut off the cage, to close that distance, and I think the, the lateral movement, the athleticism, the speed, and the power of Danielle Taylor is what's going to win her a decision here. So I'm not worried at all about the 7-inch reach uh, disadvantage. The only thing I'd be worried about is, you know, if she decided to abandon all that movement and just stand in front of JJ and, you know, get into a striking brawl for, uh, for her ego, which you and I both know, Shaq, Danielle's not on that. Danielle, what would she say in her interview after the Jessica Panay fight? She was like, everyone's got the reach on me. I'm five foot. That's why I got movement, and that's why I got angles. And that's why I'm picking Danielle Taylor for the win here. Now, next up, in the women's flyweight division, we have Jessica I. She's a minus 120 favorite, Shaq, and the comeback on Kalindra Faria is plus 100. Now, anytime you see a, a minus next to Jessica I's name, I mean, you, you kind of laugh on the inside a little bit. I mean, of course I laughed on the inside a little bit because it seems like people haven't learned their lesson. Um, look, Jessica I, I guess everyone was under the assumption that she was some top five chick at one point, and I mean, she never was. I mean... I've sat back. I've looked at her whole career. The Sarah Kaufman fight, I honestly thought she lost. Every um, round. You know, honestly, <laughs> if being, she wobbled. I mean, she did the chicken dance. I thought she lost that fight. But, hey, you know, it, it got scored for you. Congratulations. Then you move to the Alexis Davis fight where you look completely diminished of your prior self in the Kaufman fight. I mean, the Kaufman fight, you look young. I mean, I just think she's a case of, you know, she aged very fast. And, you know, what happened in the Misha Tate fight, I mean. 
She you got straight broke. Her life, you know, rocked her with a jab and then dropped her with an overhand right. And that might have been the end of Jessica I because the fight after that against Juliana, uh, Juliana Pena, I mean, if you listen to that pre-fight hype and you just listen to each uh, fighter's just demeanor, like Jessica I is just reeling back mentally. I mean, I just think she's a mental case, um, you know. And I think uh, Faria in her debut, I think it was a case of shit happens, you know? She fought a chick that's very underrated, in my opinion, Barella, who has a completely different game plan. And that's that's not going to happen in this spot. So that's completely irrelevant, in my in my opinion. Just like, you know, Alessio going to split with Gareth, at, uh, that has nothing to do with the Alawali fight, you know what I'm saying? Mateus so, being out two years. Exactly. Who gives so, a fuck? So, so what if Faria um, got subbed by Barella in, in the first round? That doesn't matter. Um, Free is a tough chick, throws big haymakers, got good takedowns. Um, I think she's lost a lot of fights fighting at 115, and, you know, she did lose her debut, but, you know, in the line in that fight was she was a considerable favorite, so it might have just been a letdown spot. Um, she was supposed to fight Andrea Lee in that fight, actually. But um, I'm going to go with Faria here. Like I said, I don't think the, the, the drop to flyweight is going to be the change of anything in Jessica I I think it's a mental issue. I think it's a, a Kylan Curran issue, a Beck Rawlings issue, you know, autopilot mode. They get hit in these fights and they just completely freak out and don't know what to do. And, you know, I think nothing's going to change. I mean, I don't see why after the batch fight where you, you know, you, okay, we'll be nice and we'll give you the first round, even though that first round was very close in my opinion. And you completely stop throwing, you completely stop fighting, you get hit with right hands and you smile and laugh and you're just looking 41 and not 31. No, look, I just think, uh, I just think, I don't see anything changing, man. So I'm going to go with Faria by a close decision. I think Kalindra wants this more. I think she's more feisty. I think she's more mean. I think uh, Eyes Boxing is very overrated. I think her defense is suspect. And uh, I got Faria in this one. If you're in the UFC and you haven't figured out how to beat Jessica I yet, I mean, what else is there to say, Shaq? You know, it's just one of those situations. If you fade Jessica I... Every single fight, you'd be 6-1. and one. Just like if you fade uh, Kylan Curran every single fight. You have to fade Jessica I. Especially if you see plus money next to it. I mean, you'd be insane not to. Even if it, even if you take an L here, fade her the next time too. It's a long-term investment. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to fade Jessica I. Don't believe the bullshit of, oh, now she's back. Oh, now this is her time. Oh, she's a new fighter at 125. Don't, give me a motherfucking break. She's not a new fighter. She's a mental case. And let's talk about her best UFC performance against uh, Leslie Smith. So what actually happened in that fight? What happened in that fight was she landed a couple combinations on a fighter that gets hit with a lot of combinations every single fight. And uh, she started slowing down a bit. She she happened to hit a cauliflower ear that hadn't been drained, and it popped. I mean, that's Leslie Smith's mistake. Leslie Smith should have fucking drained that shit the night before. Then she would have came back the second or third round and won, and we'd be talking about Jessica I being 0-7 in the UFC shack. So she got very lucky with that win. And let's not even forget that win was in fucking 2014. Okay. You know what year we're in right now, Shaq? We're in 2018. I hear motherfuckers talking about, Oh, she submitted Zoila Frosto, whatever the fuck with a fucking standing arm triangle. That was in 2012. It's 2018. That was fucking, that wasn't five years ago, Shaq. That was six years ago. Motherfuckers still talking about that. Like I just, I cannot believe it. And look, there's one big difference between the two of them, and I'll talk about that difference here in a second, but real quick, because I know people just glance over the record of Faria, and they say, oh, she lost to Aguilar, she lost to this and that, she lost to Carolina. Look, when you go back and you watch her fights at 115, she looked emaciated, she looked like a skeleton, she looked too skinny. You look her, You look at her at 125... She's fully fed. She's fully hydrated. She's performing at the highest level of her career. Now, I know my girl Morella Barella took care of her real quick, but Morella Barella's got a fucking serious body lock. Morella Barella is about to fight fucking Caitlin Chukagian. Like, I put zero. Morella Barella wins fights. Jessica I doesn't win fights. I think Kalindra Fari is going to spook her on the feet with some big combinations. Then she's going to throw some hook kicks. And if Jessica I decides, oh, you know, I'm going to surprise everyone and try to wrestle this fight, I think she's going to be in for a big surprise when it doesn't come as easy as uh, Morella Barella was able to take her down. And uh, last thing, I said what the big difference between them was, and here I'm about to say it, my friend. 
Jessica Eyes, you know, she already won in the UFC. You know, she already said, oh, it's my time four years ago. Now she's saying it's her time again. How much? You only get one time. How, how many fucking times do you have? Whereas Kalindra Faria, even though she's older, she's also 31 as well, she still has one goal left to accomplish in her career. And let's get that first UFC win. And that's exactly what I think she's going to do here, Shaq. So my pick is Kalindra Faria. Now next up in the UFC welterweight division, we got Zach Cummings. He's a minus 200 favorite. The comeback on the pit bull, or as they like to say in Brazil, Shaq, Peach Bull is plus 170. Who you got? Uh, it's a tough fight to call, man. You know, I've been high on Cummings for a while, actually. You know this, uh... I've always been high on Cummings. I've met him a couple times in a couple spots and won. Um, the guy is as big as they gets for 170. I mean, he missed weight for his last fight, and I know he's cutting. I know he's cutting 30 pounds just about. And I mean, the guy, the force on the guy's punches are big. Um, the thing is, was that Cummings he likes to block punches with his face sometimes. Now he gets away with it when he's fighting Yakovlev and Nate Coy and Dom Steele. And uh, but when he fought Santiago Ponzinibbio, Ponzinibbio, who is a top ten guy, took advantage of him. Now Tiago historically has struck like trouble with this type of opponent, aggressive guys that hit hard. Rick Story um, that can grapple too. Exactly, John Fitch, exactly Fitch twice, exactly. So once by KO. Historically, he's uh, struggled with this type of opponent before, and he just is coming off his. Typical one every two year performance where he, he looks good and you know he puts on a clinic like the John Howard fight. Everyone thought he was back and then he fought Story and it was like, oh no, never mind. And then you know it's it's the same old Tiago and what he did his last fight was absolutely disgusting in my opinion with the Mike Perry situation because you know my boy Jocko was on the flight the same flight as you and he showed up for work. How come you couldn't? You know what I'm saying? So you know why he couldn't? Exactly. He didn't want that he, smoke. He didn't want that smoke from Mike Perry and. uh that's not that. That's not a good look for my boy Tiago. Now, as far as the fight goes, I see past the victory for both guys. I don't think uh, the line is accurate in my opinion. I don't. I don't think Cummings should be that high, just because, like I said, his defense isn't the best. The guy gets hit a lot. He gets hit more than four times a minute. Um, but like we said, just historically, Tiago struggles with this type of opponent. He struggles after coming off good performances. The guy can't put two good performances in a row together to save his life. So I'm going to uh, go with Cummings in this one. This is a fight I I'm, would stay away from just because it could go either way. When you got a guy that likes to eat a lot of punches but, you know, dish one out as well, you know, it could go that way. But then sometimes his opponent capitalize on, capitalizes on the opening. So I'm going to pass it back and enjoy. But Cummings is the pick. I'm going to actually disagree with you, Shaq. I, I think the line is lined correctly, and it's lined like that for a reason. Look, you remember when Tiago Alves used to be considered the bigger guy at 170 pounds back when he fought Matt Hughes, UFC uh, 85, right, Bedlam? And uh, the motherfucker, you know, he's pissing holes on the ground. You know, he's dripping magma. I mean, the dude's like, you know, he touched Matt Hughes one time, and Matt Hughes fell. You know what I'm saying? That, that kind of shit. And you're like, wow, oh, this guy's going to knock out GSP. And then it's like, okay, well, let's fast forward a bunch of years. He's not the bigger guy at welterweight anymore. Now he's the guy who had a failed attempt to go to 155 because, uh, you know, when you get off uh, the supplements and the vitamins and you're fighting in a, diff a completely different era, now you're trying to fight in the modern area, that shit won't fly. And you talk about these modern-day welterweights, man. Those dudes are big. You talk about guys like Santiago Ponzinibbio. You talk about guys like Zach Cummings. Those are what modern-day welterweights look like. These guys are fucking massive. And, yeah, I know Zach Cummings eats a bunch of shots and stuff like that. But guess what? He doesn't go down. And I don't think he's going to go down here either. I think he's going to eat a bunch of shots, probably eat a bunch of leg kicks early on in the fight. You know, Tiago's going to look good early in the fight. He's going to land a bunch of one, two, right leg kicks, and you're going to be like, oh, you know what I mean? But then after that, he's going to get bodied. He's going to get pushed up against the fence. And then when he gets taken down that one time, you're going to see the look in Tiago's eyes when he starts looking discouraged, when he starts, you know, going back to the old Tiago, the guy who, by the way, is five and five since his UFC title shot. So you're talking about a guy that was on a six fight win streak. Now he's five and five. I mean, if that's not a decline, Shaq, then I don't know what a decline is. It's a case of uh, USADA, honestly. We all know that. In, uh, in the Matt Hughes fight, I mean, like we said, the guy was... Remember the uh, D'Souza fight back in the day? I mean, that guy to this guy losing to Jim Miller at 155. And uh, 
like we said, it's just a matter of does Tiago capitalize on the sloppy openings? And real quick, I heard people saying, oh, but you didn't look that bad against Jim Miller. Well, guess what? If you lost. bet on Tiago there, you lost. You lost. So don't give me this, oh, he didn't, didn't look that bad. I, maybe he won't look that bad Sunday either, but he's still going to take an L in my opinion. Now, yeah, I'm passing on Cummings at minus 200, but I, I really think he's the rightful favorite. I think he's going to be too physical for Tiago Alves, and I think he's going to come away here either with a decision or possibly a submission check. Now, next up in the UFC lightweight division, we got the newcomer, Matt Frivola. He's minus 235, and the one of the most exciting Mexican warriors on the UFC roster, Marco Polo Reyes, is plus 195. Now, Shaq, are you surprised they're disrespecting my boy Polo like that? Yeah, a little bit. You know, Polo Reyes, even though his record doesn't look the best at 7-4, and four, I still think the guy's a solid guy. Beat uh, Maestro Kim, and, you know, the deal with this Frivola kid, he is very aggressive. He is tenacious. But like we said with Cummings just a minute ago, he leaves a lot of openings. He likes to block punches with his face. Yeah, granted, so far he's eaten all of those. But when I see this fight on the outside... I see them. I see Frivola engaging Polo in a Mexican, in a Mexican brawl, in a Mexican war. I see Frivola coming right at him, and Polo is solid in the uh, takedown defense area. Man, Polo can grind for three rounds as well. Polo can crack, and, and Polo can crack. So this is another fight, you know, that I'm gonna uh, stay away from. I think the confidence in Frivola. We'll see. The fight hasn't happened yet, but I understand it. You believe the hype. You believe the kid's the real deal. But at the same time, Polo Reyes has more experience. He's taken his first though. He's he's seen things that Frivola hasn't. Now Frivola's got some solid wins over Manifo, but he was actually lesser of a favorite in his contender series fight than he is for this fight. Who did you find that fight again? Um, some guy named Luke Flores, who was like, yeah, you know, Luke Jabberos, exactly a jobber. So the fact that uh, they're more confident in Polo than uh, than they were against that guy, it's kind of surprising, but I'm going to take Polo Reyes in this one on the little upset, man. Um, I think he's got way more experience. Yeah, he is mid to upper 30s, but he ain't fighting James Vick no more. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> he's fighting, you know, Matt Frivola that likes to move forward recklessly and hasn't learned his lesson yet in this game. So I'm going to uh, take Polo Reyes. You know, Vic told me that Polo Reyes is one of the hardest hitters he's ever faced. Now, I know that might sound kind of funny because it didn't look like Polo landed any shots, but Vic was like, dude, I could feel the wind of those shots when I leaned back because you remember the finishing combo. He leaned back on a big uh, haymaker of Polo and then finished him with a straight right. That being said, look, I respect Matt Frivola's style a lot. He's one of these dudes that goes balls to the wall at the opening bell. Now, I think that works really well on the local scene. I think it's going to work really well in hand-picked fights. But when you're making that UFC debut, I want to see in that three-minute mark what that gas tank is looking like. Because if there's one dude who is battle-tested, if there's one dude who knows what a fucking war is like in the UFC's octagon, that's Polo Reyes. I mean, go back and watch that Dong Young Kim fight. That's a... If you want to talk about can this man overcome adversity, go watch that fight. He got wobbled a hundred times. They were both gassed one minute into the fight, and he still pulled off the cool. knockout in the third round. So that, to me, is a battle-tested UFC warrior. And, hey, if Matt Frivola is good enough to come out here and uh, steamroll him mm -hmm. like his nickname indicates, much respect. But I simply think that everyone has to pay their dues, Shaq. And, like I said... Let's look at the clock three to four minutes in. If he's, uh, if still, he's still coming at him hard, <laughs> then congratulations. Look, if the Sarah Longo product <laughs> is still coming hard and uh, he's still fresh, then hey, you, maybe you really are the real deal. But I have a feeling he's going to be looking up at that clock. He's going to be huffing and puffing. I think it's a Sheldon Westcott situation. You go back, you look at Sheldon Westcott, and uh, actually – People listening, go back and watch him. Watch him dominate Dan Kelly and absolutely destroy him. Watch him go in there with Elias Theodoro and beat him up that first round. But then when he pushes such a hard pace, he doesn't know how to manage that gas tank. He gasses out and then he gets bodied. And I think a similar thing could happen here if uh, Fervola pushes too hard of a pace and he, he can't keep it up. He did go the distance with my boy Roush Manny, Foe and Titan. You know, first two rounds he put it on Roush in the third round he did gas out but I think he was dealing with an ankle injury or something but between you and me he gassed out how, how do and, we know he's not dealing with an ankle injury here <laughs> exactly but you know he, he's a tough guy and it's just a matter of is Polo gonna capitalize on his sloppiness especially in those spurts where uh he's gonna get tired and you know it's a fun fact Matt Frivola was actually supposed to fight Mike Perry on the local scene I know a couple uh, people that dodged that bullet. <laughs> that would have been an uh, interesting fight. I wonder if Perry would have been undefeated in his debut. You know my boy Perry is taking on Max Griffin next. Yeah. 
and uh, poor Max Griffin. Look, I got a lot of respect for Max Griffin, but during that Zaleski fight, we were saying, this dude needs to take at least a year off. And not only did he not take a year off, Shaq, now he's coming back and he's facing arguably the hardest hitter in the welterweight division, UFC welterweight division, because I know Paul Daly is uh, in Bellator now. But, uh, Douglas Lima's in Bellator. Douglas Lima's in Bellator, too. <laughs> but you get the gist of it, my man. So, uh, look, I'm going to go Polo Reyes, but if Matt Frivola is really the real deal, then, hey, I'll give him his due respect like I always do. Next up, also in the UFC lightweight division, we got James Krause. He's minus 160, and the comeback on Alex White is plus 140. Now, look, Alex White came through for us big against Mitch Clark, but that was Mitch Clark. You and I both know James Krause is a big step up, but do you think Alex Christ, <laughs> do you think Alex White has made the proper improvements to rise to the occasion in a spot like this? Um, I actually bet on both these guys in their last fight. Seven units uh, on Alex White to beat Mitch Clark. Came through for me. Uh, poor Mitch. Alex, uh, that was a brutal beating. He retired him. And then, you know, I bet Krause's last fight, it was like minus 385 against Galicchio. I mean, if you can't beat Galicchio, I don't even know what to say. It Should have been fucking minus 1,085. Exactly, yeah, I mean, if you can't beat Tom Galicchio, you should not be in the UFC. And, you know, Krause, before the Ultimate Fighter show, I have no I have no understanding why he was even on the Ultimate Fighter show. I'll and tell you why. 230K. But you see where his head's at. He's already in the UFC, and he's he, he, look. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna criticize the guy. He's a tough guy. He's a good fighter. Um, I do think he is on the decline a little bit, as we saw in the Shane Campbell fight. Shane Campbell's an old man with that kickboxing K1 chin, and Krause is struggling with him on the mat. Krause is a black belt. I mean, they were reversing each other, and right at the end there, I mean, between them, between them two. Somebody got their ass beat. Playground <laughs> rules. Uh, we all know Shane Campbell won that shit. Exactly. So, at the end of that fight, Kraus was getting his head smashed in. And, you know, he goes on the Ultimate Fighter, uh, fights Johnny Nunes. Uh, I saw him get uh, cracked with a left hook and, you know, get dropped. You know, granted, Johnny Nunes is... Fucking Misha uh, Tate. Well, he's fucking Misha Tate, so he's winning at life anyways, but... Fucking his skills suck, and he has no cardio. There's he, a, wait, Johnny. Johnny never made a UFC debut, <laughs> <exactly>. right? <laughs> Johnny never won anything in the tough house or anything UFC related. So just put it that way. And I mean, Kraus was struggling with that guy, but uh, then he fights ran back and forth war, and then you know we're talking about uh, Jesse Taylor. Jesse Taylor was just too big, s smashed him on the mat. No shame in that one. I'll I'll, I'll excuse him off the Jesse Taylor one. But, I mean, those two fights, I mean, that just shows you how much of a decline his skills are on. Because, I mean, personally, in my opinion, I feel like if you would have put uh, Ramsey, Galicchio, and Nunes in the UFC with, with the Alex Whites of the lightweight division, even guys on that level, I think they would actually absolutely get smashed 100%. But we know MMA math doesn't work. But the bottom line is, I think Kraus... His striking is on the decline. I think his jujitsu is on the decline. And I think he has one foot out the door. The guy's working for Fox Sports. He wants to be a manager. He wants to be a coach. I know he's wanting to transition out of this really soon. I think this possibly could be a good spot for Alex White to capitalize. But Alex White has to show up 100% because this is the toughest fight of his career um, besides the Tony Martin fight. Um, the Tony Martin fight, I feel like it was just a case of being overwhelmed for the first time in your first fight at 155 pounds. I mean, he went from fighting. Look at the for, physicality exactly. of Tony Martin. When when you're in there with Tony Martin and he gets hit like right off the way, and then you know he gets tied up like that with a guy that size, and Tony Martin has all the skills to be a top 15 guy. It's just a matter of figuring out the mental side of things. And I, I mean, when Alex White hit that guy, Tony instantly went ankle diving. Just put it that Tony way. Tony hit a knee. <laughs> Tony didn't want no smoke on the feet. Just put it that way. And uh, I think Alex White has to show up. You know, Alex does leave some openings as well. You know, he does get hit. He likes to block punches with his face as well. But I don't think that matters in this spot. I don't think Kraus has the power to put him out. Kraus is very confident that he's going to uh, finish him. And if Kraus is the better fighter, then he's the better fighter. He's definitely the more experienced fighter. He's fought the better competition. But like I said, I think the guy's on the decline. When you can't finish Galicchio, granted, he dominated, but you should have. can't you finish Ramsey. You, you go to a back and forth war with you Ramsey, you bro. You, you should have got these guys, these bums out of you here. You get dropped by Johnny Nunes. Yeah, you know like, I know he's fucking Misha Tate, but come on, bro. That doesn't give him power. Like, <laughs> that doesn't make him a good fighter. I mean, I bet Caraway could beat Johnny Nunes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, if they see each other on the street, they will have a word. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, fucking, 
you know, he should have got rid of those guys, but granted, he got the job done for the most part. But I'm going to take Alex White in a little sneaky upset here. I think Alex is going to show up in the best form of his career in better shape than what he's been looking like. I think the fact that the guy was fighting at 145, he personally told us that the guy, he got up a size 188, 189 at featherweight. And I mean, that's a 40, 50 pound weight drop. And now he's looking real big at lightweight, and uh, I'm interested to see how Kraus reacts when that straight two lands. Yeah, I am as well. And look, I'm not trying to pull a Brian Stan here when I'm criticizing Kraus for those performances. You know, Brian Stan's all like, if he doesn't get a finish, if he wants to move up the ranks, yeah, he needs a finish it's here. Completely different. See, when Stan says that, the guy is generally in control the entire time and yeah. dominating, and he says that. As where Kraus, I mean, he's scraping through these fights. Yeah, exactly. What I'm trying to say here, gentlemen and ladies, is that Kraus was going back and forth with absolute scrubs, whereas when Brian Stan criticizes guys like Rashid Magomedov, it's a 30-27 <laughs> scorecard, you know? So this isn't that kind of situation where I'm like, oh, he should have finished him. Oh, but he won anyways. No, no, no. It was back and forth, ugly, where you know in the actual UFC, not just in the tough house, that shit's not going to fly. And when you talk about Alex White, you're talking about a kid that's come a long way. You watch his first three UFC fights, and you might think, okay, yeah, he's barely holding on to his spot on the UFC roster, you know, keeps his head straight up in the air, all these things. But then you watch his last three fights. Talk about improvement, Shaq, because ever since he moved to 55, those last two specifically, so the Tony Martin fight, look, when you look at the physicality of Tony Martin, you understand why Tony was able to grind that fight. If James Krause... <laughs> Can do that, which I highly doubt because he's nowhere near as physical as Tony Martin. Look, I think Tony Martin would do that to James Kraus as well, man. Like, Jesse Taylor did that to Kraus. But look, bottom line here is that James Kraus is nowhere near as physical as Tony Martin. And you saw what happened when Tony Martin got cracked. He went down to two knees, you know, and then he decided, oh, you know, we're going to... I didn't know he was a... You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, it was one of those situations. But uh, with Alex White here, if you look at his physique in his last fight specifically... That, to me, is someone that's growing into their body. That, to me, is someone that belongs at 155 pounds. And you look at that performance. Yeah, I understand it was a complete scrub and Mitch Clark, but let's talk about that for a second. Mitch Clark's a guy, he didn't get finished by uh, Kiesa. He's a guy that finished Aya Kinta. And uh, so let's put it this way. Aya Kinta and Kiesa, two top 15 guys, they couldn't put this scrub away. And Alex White put an absolute fucking clinic on him and more importantly than putting on that clinic he looks so much better physically speaking he looked more relaxed he looked more mature and yeah i know he eats shots but since when has Krause ever put anyone down what he put sam stout down a hundred years ago fucking frankie perez with two career knockouts put down uh sam stout as well you know actually one career knockout if we're being honest about it you know what i'm saying Shaq? so it's just one of those situations where I'm not worried about, oh, his little pussy-ass front kick. And look, when I say that, you know, we're, we're being funny here. We're being entertaining. I understand. I fully understand that would put me down with one shot. I get that. But guess what, guys? You know, it's funny because when I was talking all that shit about Khalil last week, someone's like, oh, I'd love to see Daniel Levy try to take down Khalil. Hey, stupid. I never said I could beat him. I just said 90% of the UFC light heavyweight division could beat him. And with that being said, I think that most of the UFC lightweights in today's uh, era could be James Krause as well because James Krause doesn't want to be there anymore. James Krause has shown up for that final paycheck. He wants to bounce out the game. He wants to get into coaching. You know, he wants to do his thing, open up, you know, run that gym, do do the whole bit, manage fighters, go on Fox Sports. I get it, man. Like, and I respect him. He had a great career. The dude's been fighting for years. Twenty-four year. and seven. You fucking remember that fight with Cowboy Cerrone a million years ago in the WEC? Like, that's how long this kid's been fighting. So when you talk about a crossroads fight, this is a crossroads fight because they're literally going to trade places. The only difference is when I say trade places, I don't mean that all of a sudden Alex White's about to be a faded vet. <laughs> what I mean is that Alex White's going to take the name value of Kraus, add it to his resume, and then people are going to remember, oh, Alex White's signature win over James Kraus. I think that's what's going to happen. I think he's going to bruise James Kraus. I think he's going to beat up on James Kraus. I think when James Kraus tries to come in with these sloppy doubles, they're going to get shucked. He's going to eat some big elbows. And then on the feet, yeah, I know Alex likes to block punches with his face, but here's the difference between him and Kraus. Alex is so much more durable. He's going to eat those shots, whereas Kraus is going to feel every single shot that, that Alex White lands. And evidence of that is, I mean, fucking Johnny Nunes is dropping this dude. He's going to a back-and-forth war with Ramsey Nijem in 2017. I'm not saying he went to a back-and-forth war with Ramsey Nijem back in 2012. I'm saying he went to a fucking back-and-forth war with him last goddamn year. So that's not going to fly here. Guys that were out of the UFC while you were in the UFC. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So I, I think this is a perfect spot for Alex White to come in here, bruise the boy up, and props to anyone that took that plus 170. 
Now, next up in the UFC featherweight division, we got the debut, the featherweight debut of Michael the Menace Johnson. He's minus 155, and the comeback on Darren the Damage Elkins is plus 135. Now, you know, Darren Elkins, people keep counting him out. He's always the underdog. He's the underdog again. Is he about to, you know, extend that five-fight win streak into a six-fight win streak, my man? I mean, Darren Elkins is the fucking underdog king, man. Like, every time... His whole win streak, I thought he was going to lose all of these fights, probably. Like, I haven't thought he was going to win one of these fights, and he keeps doing it. Elkins, we know the deal with Elkins. He'll eat a tremendous shot. We know that he will never quit. We know that he'll grind anyone out. We know that the guy's tenacious, and he's got the heart of a lion. And we know Michael Johnson in that department is the complete opposite. We know Michael Johnson, on his given best day, can take out anyone. He he knocked out Poirier. He beat Tony Ferguson. He fought... He fucking schooled Edson for three rounds. The guy's got three of the best wins at 155. But, I mean, historically, if you can just wear on the kid, if you can let the kid know that you're not going to quit. What did Kevin Lee say about him? He's got 30 fights and he's lost half of them. You know, so, look, it's going to be, a, it's a simple case. Well, I'm gonna I'm staying away from this fight because, look, I love Elkins. But, look, when, you, when, you're, fi when you're fighting at this level now, Sometimes you won't be able to get away with certain things, and there's going to be a day where Elkins just gets completely smoked out the water. I mean, he's like he did versus Chad Mitch. Some days you get blown out the water, and we've seen that happen to Elkins in the past. But granted, Michael Johnson's on the decline as well, man. The guy is taking a lot of damage, man. A lot of damage, especially those last two fights, Khabib, and then the Gaethje fight. I mean, he got completely broken in a way. So. I'm not going to go on Michael uh, Johnson's side and or Elkin's side in terms of betting. This is a fight I'm going to sit back and enjoy. I am going to go with Michael Johnson. I do think uh, you know, maybe dropping a featherweight. I'm not saying it's the answer because I'll tell you right now, it ain't the answer. But <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of the answer, him and Edgar exactly. fight and he's fucked. <laughs> exactly. It ain't the answer long term, I'll tell you that right now. It might be for this fight because early on, you know, Michael Johnson's one of these guys that he needs to get off to a good start mentally because we know historically if things don't go good for him, if something bad, dramatic happens, he's not the type of guy to come back. You know what I'm saying? I know he has come back in the past against Danny Castillo and some other guys, but historically speaking, he will break. Remember the Miles Jury fight? That was a, a, typical, a typical scenario like this where, you know, he had everything to lose, but... I'm going to go on Michael. I just think the speed's going to be too much in the first round. I actually think he might put him out. Um, I love Elkins, but, man, first round, if Michael shows up like how he did against Gaethje, Elkins ain't used to the, the, the power of featherweights. But the thing is, I wouldn't be shocked if Michael just come came in coming up short on everything because we know he, he's known for coming up short on everything. Like, Look at that Benil fight. Exactly, but he is always historically due for – a good performance once every three or four fights. You know, this is the way he works. So I'm going to go with MJ. I'm going to sit back and enjoy. I can't get on the side because, like I said, one day Elkins is going to get smoked. And it's going to be sad, but he is going to get smoked one day. And this could be the time. But th Michael Johnson is not the type of guy you can rely on in consistent spots. I mean, the guy's a flake. Look, I agree with part of what you said. I agree. That first round, the speed will be too much. However, if this goes past the first round, oh, then Michael's fucked. <laughs> that's when MJ starts to slow down, and that's when Darren Elkins becomes an unstoppable force because you hear these stories about him sparring uh, some very tough Russians at Team Alpha Male. And as you know, in the gym when you're sparring, you know, it's not just a three, five minute round. It's not just 15 minutes. You can go as long as, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. Some people have two hour sessions. But bottom line, what I'm trying to get at here is I hear these dudes would light up Darren Elkins for like six rounds. <laughs> straight and then they get so tired from lighting him up then they'd be like hey man thanks thanks for the sparring great session and darren would be like wait you got you guys are done like i'm just getting started and these dudes would be so cast out and then elkins would start teeing off on them you know what i mean so listen i've seen i've seen elkins uh and benito lopez sparring in the gym and let's just say it was getting very ugly let's just say benito got broken <laughs> but uh listen i think it was a perfect fight for live betting if you know about live betting i think let just Keep an eye and gauge uh, how Michael Johnson's looking yeah. at the end of that first round if he hasn't put Elkins away yet because 
after that first round, if he's huffing and puffing, if if uh, oh, if Henry Hoof <laughs> is Henry Hoof asking him not to quit, that's when put you go and Elkins. put that plus money on Darren Elkins between the first and second round. You know what I'm saying? But pre bet, uh, you have to be super sharp with the call. And for me personally, like I, I'm not trying to flip a coin and decide if the speed's going to be too much or if the grindage of of Elkins is going to be too much. That's why I suggest you live bet a fight like this between the first and second round. And uh, hopefully it doesn't end in the first, you know, for those doing that. So I'm going to go with Elkins. I'm going to go the opposite side of you. I think that, you know, dropping a featherweight for MJ is a desperation move. Look, you have wins over Poria. You have wins over the fucking champ Ferguson and Edson Barboza. The only reason you're dropping, let's be honest, there's a couple possible reasons. We know my we opinion, <laughs> my opinion is desperation. You know, we lost 405 and this and that. But there's some, there's some other possibilities. You know, a lot of things change in the sport and people tend to drop weight classes for certain reasons. And that could be a, a case here because when I <laughs> because when I looked at uh, the pictures and I like, you know, remember back in the day when Diego Sanchez dropped 155? I'm not talking about recent. I'm talking about like UFC 95, like when he fought Joe Stevenson and like People are looking at his physique and they're like, wow, Diego at 155 is going to be unstoppable and all, all this shit. Like, this isn't that situation at all. And and for those listening that are newer fans. Dropping to 45 ain't the answer. For those listening that are newer fans, Diego Sanchez was once viewed as the number one contender in the lightweight division. So those are the times I'm referring to real quick. And the reason I bring that up is because when I look at these pictures of MJ, it's not like, oh, he's ripped. Oh, he's a new man. Oh, it's a new beginning at 45. It ain't at that at all. It's a desperation move. That being said, the speed really really could be too much because the kid they call him blackie out for a reason he's going to be throwing some serious heat so it comes down to elkins durability elkins is called the damage because he can take damage he's also been stopped before by a guy in uh, chad mendes who hits like a truck so it's either elkins going to go down or not by the way my boy ted worthington's going to be at home watching this fight you know ted worthington's that jobber on the local what's his scene, record uh like 36 and 55 or something like that maybe so, you know one of those jobber records but he finished both these guys so my boy ted worthington's going to be at home uh in in uh my boy ted worthington's going to be at home enjoying this fight and uh laughing that he finished both these guys now, kicking off the main card in the UFC welterweight division, we got Kamaru Usman. He's minus 650. The comeback on Emil Meek is plus 475. Now, look, a very wide line, my man. But let me ask you something. Is it first L time for uh, Usman in the UFC? Man, um, Kamaru Usman seems to be pretty obsessed with our boy Kobe Covington. I mean, for a good month or two, that's all he was talking about was Kobe, Kobe, Kobe. Between you and me, Kobe will whoop that ass. And, and, and to be honest... Uh, I don't think he's. I don't think he really wants any smoke from Kobe. That's my honest opinion. I don't think he wants that smoke from Kobe in that cage. But look, Usman's a solid guy, and he wants Emil Mick instead. Exactly. He, that's there's a, there's a reason they gave you the Emil Mech fight. You know what I'm saying? And don't sleep on my boy Mech because everyone forgets that this dude knocked out Husimar back when Husimar was like top ten in the world. And I mean, and knocked him out quick. I bet on Husimar in that fight <laughs> in my uh, jobber days and. Emil Mech fucking smoked that guy, so he shocked the world before. You know, granted his fight with Jordan Mean, I mean, I thought he won every round pretty much, but you know there were some little hairy moments. But uh, it looked like he was dealing with an injury. Yeah, he, he had a, a torn rib or something like that. And but this is a a serious letdown spot. This is like the letdown spots of letdown spots for Usman. I mean, beating Mech means nothing. Fuck all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, you beat Mech. That you did what you're supposed to do, but he better dominate him if he wants to be in conversations with Kobe. All right, Brian Stan. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, Usman's talking a big game. Kobe 30 26, Damian Maya. Kobe 30 25, Dung Young Kim, like in Asia and Brazil. Like, and that's, that's just a, facts. And that's just facts. So he better dominate him if he wants to fight Kobe. Um, but this is a letdown spot, man. People parlaying Usman, I don't understand it at all. I mean, that's that's ridiculous in my opinion. Granted, I'm not saying that he's going to lose, but letdown spots happen. You know what I'm saying? We see it time after time. And uh, Usman, boxing-wise, you know, yeah, he did knock out Serginho, but I did see some openings. But like we said, Mech hasn't fought in how long? Um, like over a year at least, right? Over a year. I'm not gonna count on him either. I think the line, I think the fight will play out closer than what the line indicates. But I will take Usman. I think he'll be able to grind it out. Um, I think there will be some hairy spots in the fight, especially when you got a guy in mech size throwing punches. And uh, you know, we'll see how uh, 
Kamara's chin is, but people are high on Kamara, man. If he if he dominates this fight, he could get a big fight next. Maybe Santiago. Um, oh man, you know what I'm saying. So we'll see if he wants. <laughs> Santiago to, would light would light him up. You know what I'm saying. So he better be ready for my boy Ponza's eye poking game. But uh, I'm gonna go with Kamara on this one. 30-27, uh, maybe a 29-28. Look, I disagree with people saying that Kamara is the number one prospect in the UFC welterweight division. I think that's a complete joke. Look, I think he's had some very hand-picked fights, and he's completely dominated those opponents, and much respect to him for it. But I think as soon as he steps up, he's going to get exposed because that striking is super stiff. And uh, you saw Serginio tagging him up. Granted, uh, Usman did what he's supposed to do. He put him away. And he can very well come out here and win this fight. And I'm not going to be surprised if he does because you watch some of those Emil Meek fights on the regional scene, man. The punching technique the kid has is very, very ugly. But one thing about Mech is the kid's physical too. The kid's a a little. The kid's been taking uh, his Valhalla supplements, if you know what I mean. So uh, he can he can probably take a shot here. I expect this to go the distance if they keep it standing. Then again, then again, one punch could change everything. I'm not going to be surprised. If Emo Mika throws that big overhand and hands Kamaru Usman his first UFC L, not going to be shocked. But I do think it's lying like this for a reason. Because I think that if Kamaru says, okay, maybe it's getting a little hairy on the feet, I need to take it to the ground, that's where I think he can have success, grinding him out. Because I think since he's fallen in love with his stand-up so much, a lot of us forgot how dominant he is in those tie-ups, in that clinch, with his wrestling, and even though he's but not like a, he's said, not D1. But like you said, he is falling in love with the stand-up. He just got his first knockout. Maybe he comes in here thinking he can box now. Yeah, I mean, listen, man... It, it's not going to end well is all I have to say. You know, you, you people talking about how he's a future world champion. Oh, uh, you're just, in for a rude awakening just, on that because it's going to ha- It might not happen here, but it's going to happen soon. And uh, listen, if, for everyone parlaying a minus 650. Uh, how many times have we told you? You know, listen, man. If it's not good enough to play straight, then why, why is it good enough to parlay? And I know some square is going to be like, oh, you get a lower line. It's like, no, no, no. You're still betting him at minus 650. And if he's not good enough to bet straight, then why are you parlaying it, you fucking degenerate? So, listen, I'm a betting man, and I'm passing on this. But as a betting man, I'd love to see a plus 475 underdog come through and spoil plans because underdogs, I mean, look, underdogs are what makes this shit. You know what I'm saying? And if everyone was right... You know, Vegas, uh, those big Vegas casinos wouldn't be around. So, uh, look, probably Kamaru is going to be too physical for the very physical Viking. But uh, at the end of the day, I think Kamaru is going to grind him down and win a decision. But uh, don't don't be surprised if a haymaker lands and uh, people are shocked here. Just just don't be surprised. But I'm going to go with Kamaru Usman by decision. Now, next up in the women's flyweight division, we have Jessica Rose Clark. She's minus 110. And Paige Van Zant is also minus 110. Now, Shaq, isn't it interesting when you see a minus next to Paige Van Zant's name? And I mean, like, yeah, I get it. She was on Dancing with the Stars. But what the fuck's that got to do with the UFC? Um, I actually thought she would open a bigger favorite, to be honest. Um, so I guess the reality is checking in for people that she ain't shit. Uh, she's a tough girl, good shape. She's always in good shape. That's not going to change. She's always in good shape, but I mean, her skills haven't improved. She's always in good shape, and she always can't throw straight punches. (laughs) She always can't fight nicely. She (laughs) always gets tagged with every punch her opponent throws, and I think she's a case of being marketed the right way and a case of, you know, getting the right fights. Now, people would say I'm dumb for saying that because, oh, well, she beat Felice, but what people don't understand is back then, what year was that fight in? 2000, pre-Reebok, just put it that way. Felice was quick tapping on the ultimate fighter house against random Marco. She was in a different state of mind. Trust me, if that fight happened now, Felice would 30, 26. Or, It'd be a first round finish, exactly, honestly. honestly. You know what I'm saying? Look, it's I like, heard an interview with Felice. She said that she her body completely herself. shut down after one minute. She said she couldn't feel it. Like, yeah, I believe it because you watch the fight. Yeah, it's like, whoa, see like Felice, what's going on there, man? Body completely shut down, was starving herself to make weight. You know, congrats to Paige. She won the fight, but... And, and you saw that just came in. She had to get her levels right. Exactly. And then, you know, so after that fight... She fights uh, Alex Chambers. I mean, come on. Do I even have to explain that? If you haven't figured out how to beat Alex (laughs) Chambers yet. (laughs) Do I I really have to explain beating Alex Chambers? Okay. And then, you know, she goes there to uh, Rose Namajunas. I mean, then we finally see that she's not on this level completely. Now, Rose completely dominated her. There were four 10-8 rounds, in my opinion. Complete domination. I mean, 
it was horrendous. Now, granted, I'm not saying that uh, if Rose Clark goes in there with Rose, she'd win. But, I mean, I think she put up a lot better of a fight. But Rose Clark's a lot bigger. And, granted, all these fights are at 115 pounds where she's getting taken down easily by Rose Nami Yunus at the time where Rose was in a severe state of mind at the time. You remember, that was, that was back when Rose was... Little Miss Fragile, you know what I'm saying? So emotional support, <laughs> exactly, dog. Rose. You know what I'm saying? So um, then after that fight, she gets you know Beck Rawlings, who was on an alleged two fight win streak over Sohi and some other chick. And she, granted, she and granted, and you, you know she lost to Sohi, but it was just a case of she fought a soccer mom. I mean, you guys know you've heard me say Beck Rawlings is a she's an autopilot mode chick, man. When things don't go her way, she freaks out like Jessica I. She freaks out like Kylan, mm-hmm. and they. They drift off, and they really don't have a purpose in there. And I mean, that shit was awful. The first round was terrible. I, I just plain up, I, I straight up just think that Rose Clark's on a completely different level now. Don't get me wrong. Rose Clark has got a lot of losses on her record. But look at the weight of that. At 145. 145, 135. Paige is going up to 125 looking for an answer, switching camps out of Alpha Male. Now she's training with her boyfriend somewhere. Um, you <laughs> Should know, we tell them about how... <clears throat> They try to get <laughs> they try to get us to interview her boyfriend. I'm, I'm like, uh, I don't give a shit about that. I don't guy. give a fuck about him. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I don't see any improvements happening for her when Karate Hadi finishes you in under what three minutes, two minutes, whatever it was. Then they con- solidified, confirmed. Okay, this chick's not on this level. She's not good. Rose Clark actually is improving every day. Ever since you know. She uh she used to go out with uh whatever his name was guy with the face tattoos that got smashed by Ben Tim. Jules the Jackal. Exactly, you know what I'm saying. You know she knocked him exactly. out. Exactly, right? she knocked him out. And I mean, like I said, I think not only that, did she knock him out, she peeled off the hands of a choke and then knocked him out with a head kick. You know what I'm saying? So she's on she's on that uh that street shit. But uh, I think Rose Clark's gonna be too much for her, too big. I don't think uh Paige Rains. I think she made a big mistake coming up uh, up in the way to 125 because Rose Clark, like we said, used to weigh 145, and it just seems like gradually she's getting slimmer and better shape now that you know she's out of that situation that she was in, living in Vegas, got a whole entire gym to herself. She's the main focus, working at the UFC Performance Institute. I think she's going to be too much for Paige in the striking. I actually think she can move around for three rounds and strike like she showed in her debut. I actually consider her win over back better than Paige's because, you know, a little fluke, uh, you know, head kick when the soccer mom goes down. But at least, <laughs> at least Rose Clark fucking beat her ass for three rounds. I don't know how that was a split. I mean, Rose Clark won that entire fight. One of the judges was fucking Beck. He was from Australia, you know. And uh, Rose Clark won that entire fight. And I mean, her striking looked good. The grappling looked good. She trained with uh, Casey Halstead, 10th Planet Las Vegas, you know, Team Oyama's jiu-jitsu coach. So, She's, uh, I think she's going to be very prepared. Like I said, I think Paige has holes in her wrestling, jiu-jitsu, striking. Her cardio is good, but I just think I don't see any improvements in her game. I don't see why anything should change. I know she's young, but I don't think I don't think it's just going to come. I think she's one of those chicks where she's not really that much of an athlete. You know what I'm saying? I think that what she is is just what she is. Look, it's one of these situations like this for me. I consider Paige Van Zandt on the same level as Jessica I or Kylan Kern. There's only one fundamental I'm difference. I'm getting to it. There's only one fundamental difference. Mm-hmm. Jessica I and Kylan Kern have way better technique than Paige Van Zandt, but they're 100 times more mentally weak than Paige Van Zandt. Paige Van Zandt has way worse technique than Kylan Kern and Jessica I, but she's 100 times more mentally strong than them. So look, she's... She's a tough chick. She won't quit, but uh, she can't fight. I mean, dude, her technique is fucking atrocious, <laughs> and you know she's tried two different approaches in the UFC. She's tried the relentless approach where she you know comes forward and lands shots and eats shots and this and that, and that might work against you know Alex Chambers. against fucking Alex Chambers and you know this and that, but that ain't gonna work here against Rose Clark, who you know is coming down from forty five, then coming down from thirty five, and she's been in there. You know, she went the distance with Sarah Kaufman, who you know was once considered the best thirty five er on planet Earth. That one point and you know went three rounds striking with her and i just feel like <laughs> when Paige Van Zandt, look if, if she takes that approach where she comes in and charges you know recklessly she's gonna get countered all day if she takes the other approach where she runs around the ring doesn't do anything then tries her fucking <laughs> stupid ass karate kicks which you know when i say karate kicks i feel like that's almost disrespectful to real karate fighters like wonder boy like machida with their chain now but uh, <laughs> I feel like that's disrespectful to real karate fighters uh, calling those karate techniques. It's just she runs around and spams a bunch of bullshit. I just don't 
think that's going to work here. I know Rose Clock doesn't have a name, so that's why the line might be kind of close, but I think she's going to make a name for herself here. And uh, Rose Clark's knocked dudes out with head kicks before, okay? I know Shaq already talked about that, but uh, I, I don't see Paige Van Zandt knocking dudes out, I'll tell you that right now. And uh, I think uh, Paige Van Zandt's going to get hit with a lot of shots, and I'm not sure it's going to be a finish, but I definitely think she's going to lose a decision. I think that the work... Jessica Rose Clark's been putting in at the Performance Institute is going to pay dividends here because you look at the shape she's in, man. She's losing weight. That's peak physical yeah. shape right there. And that's no desperation. That's oh, not trying to save my career. That's <laughs> that's real shit right Dedication, there. Right All right, right. As Paige Van Zandt, yeah, you know, one last attempt to revive her career. And then after this, go back to Dancing with the Stars. Go back and do your other shit, you know. Go back. Fucking tell, uh, tell everyone that once you make your UFC debut, you're going to shave your head for cancer patients and then don't do it, you fucking liar. So I, I think that she's going to come out here and take another L and then get further exposed. And you're going to realize that Paige Van Zandt ain't shit so i got jessica rose clark for the victory co-main event of the evening uriah hall he's minus 325 the comeback on vitor belfort or as we like to say in brazil shack vitor belfort is plus 265 so let, let me start with this one man on uriah hall's best day he can knock out musasi and he can knock out jocko on uriah hall's worst day He'll lose a decision to John Howard. So you tell me right here, right now on half the battle shack, is your eye hog going to make it happen here and get this fucking big win over Vitor? Or is he going to ask him for an autograph in the center of the UFC's octagon? Um, I don't know. And I honestly don't give a fuck, Daniel. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just going to sit back and enjoy this one because you don't bet post you side of Vitor in 2000, what, 2018. I don't give a fuck who it's against. And then motherfucking Uriah Hall. All right, yeah. real quick, sorry. Who you got, Vitor Belfort versus Sam Alvey? Um, <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> we can game plan for that fight. It's different, but especially if Faraz is like, right? <laughs> we can game plan for that fight. But um, Uriah Hall is just as un untrustworthy. Not only did he lose to John Howard, he lost to Kelvin, who was a welterweight, and he lost to Rafael Natal. I mean, the guy is. And, I mean, not to mention, even though he lost to Brunson and Musashi the second time, it was one of the cases where he was, like, still conscious, and he was, like, looking up. But deep down, he just didn't want anymore. He wanted to go home. He wanted to – sometimes guys want to go home, man. It happens. And at minus – what is it? Minus 325? Give me a break, Dan. You already know what I'm on. You know what I'm saying? And uh, this is the type of fight where, you know, I think Uriah Hall should touch him up and get him out – get get him out of here early. But, I mean – what if he does want to get an autograph in the middle of the cage? I never know where the guy's head's at. I think he's in a good spot. But at minus 325, am I willing to find out? Fuck no, I'm not. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy my pick as Uriah Hall by first or second round KO. Now people are thinking, well, why don't you play it if you think he's going to knock him out in the first round? Because you don't play him in that spot. You don't play Uriah Hall at minus 325 in that spot. Ever. I, I mean, Uriah <laughs> Hall, like we just said, man, best performances, he can beat Musasi, he can beat Jocko. Worst performances, you can't even beat fucking John Howard. So, <laughs> And that's all. Like, I, I just want no part of it. Yeah, he should probably come out here and put Vitor away. He's way too athletic. He's way too dynamic. He was also way too athletic and way too dynamic for John Howard, too. So, you know, it's just one of those things. And look, I don't think the Vitor Blitz is shit anymore. It hasn't been shit for years. But if Uriah Hall is, uh, you know what I'm saying, if uh, he has a Vitor Belfort poster on his wall and he's been looking at it every night don't be surprised when he stares at vitor and gets caught with one of those blitzes but i just don't see that happening i think uh uriah is going to put him away in the first or second and vitor is going to retire but uh you know there's a reason no one has an 100 percent hit rate because upsets do happen in this sport shack and they happen all the time they happen when you least expect them that being said i'm going with the favorite here uriah hall by knockout main event of the evening the Korean Superboy, Do Ho Choi, he's minus 160, and the comeback on Jeremy Lil Heathen Stevens is plus 140. Now, Shaq, I heard a lot of people saying that Jeremy Stevens doesn't have knockout power, even though I believe he has 16 to 18 knockouts on his record. Not to mention, what he's known for is uh, he gets that one knockout uh, once every two years. Now, it's been about two years since his last knockout. Is this going to be that, that case where he comes back and finally gets his uh, once every two year KO win? I mean, Jeremy. Whoever said Jeremy Stevens doesn't have knockout power is 
That's a joke. They started watching the sport six months ago. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a fucking joke. I mean, we saw what he did to my boy, Rafael Dos Anjos, back in the day. You know, stiffened him up. We saw what he did to Marcus Davis. We saw what he did to Honey Jason back when Honey Jason was supposed to be, you know, the future of Brazil and all this. And Honey that. Jason was Conor <laughs> McGregor. You know what I'm saying? And Honey Jason was supposed to be the man. And I mean, to say he doesn't have knockout power is ridiculous. It's just that. He's fighting guys that know how to game plan for that shit. He's fighting Hanato Moicano. You know what Hanato Moicano can do? He can keep a game plan for three rounds and execute it. He can move around and avoid the big shots. You know what else uh, fucking Frankie Edgar can do? He can game plan. He <laughs> Frankie, can shoot uh, Frankie wobbled a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie did one of the biggest chicken dances of 2016. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So um, I feel like Jeremy's fought way better guys. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the, the blueprint to beat Jeremy is not tough at all. It's, can you move around for three rounds and avoid brawling with him? The thing is, in my opinion, Duho Choi is not the type of guy to move around for five rounds this time and pick somebody apart. He's the type of guy that wants to get in your face and get you the fuck out of here. Now, granted, if he knocks out Jeremy Stevens, that'll be a huge statement. You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, I don't think he's going to. I think Jeremy's going to outlast him. I think Jeremy has the better chin. Now, we've seen Duho hurt in that cup fight bad, and, you know, yes, he has taken the right amount of time off, but if this gets into a street fight and he and he hasn't knocked Jeremy out and Jeremy starts turning it up on him, you know, giving him the vet ta- the vet tactics and, you know, testing that chin, I think Jeremy's going to knock him out somewhere late in the fourth and fifth round. But if Duho comes with the right game plan, it's a winnable fight. But like I said, I'm taking Jeremy Stevens in this fight. I think Jeremy's going to be too much for him, too physical. I think Duho will win the first round, but I think the longer Jeremy stays in there, I think his cardio is going to be better. Jeremy's one of these guys that they think he's got bad cardio, but, I mean, for the style that he has, the guy has to put in uh, all his effort into his shots. And, I mean, like I said, I think his chin will last longer than Duho, so I'm going with Jeremy by fourth round finish. And uh, we'll see where Jeremy goes from there. Look, man, when the fight first got announced, I actually agreed with this pick. I was actually going to go with Jeremy myself. You know, he's been in there with the better guys. And Duho, you know, kind of got exposed in that Cub Swanson fight a million years ago. And he's been out since. But the more I think about it, I'm like, man, you know Jeremy Stevens has the most losses in UFC history, right? Because he's got the most fights. (laughs) And there's a reason he's got the most losses in UFC history. On one hand, you can say because he's got the most fights. On the other hand, you can say it's because the blueprint's been out for a fucking century how to beat Jeremy Stevens. And uh, look, I know Duho, he's this precise pinpoint striker, and he's been able to get a bunch of jobbers out of there. But I think he does have what it takes to rise to the occasion. But he has to come out here and be smart about it. He can't just come out here and slug with Jeremy like he did with Cub Swanson because uh, if he comes out here like that, he's going to get... He's going to take a canvas nap. I'll tell you that right here right now in half the battle shack. But what I think he's able to do is I think in the last year, I'm sure he's been working on some things. I'm sure he saw the holes in his game. And those Koreans come back better, man. Those Koreans can fight, man. You saw my boy Korean Zombie come back after that layoff. You saw my boy Dong Young Kim. Fucking, uh, I know Kyung Ho Kang's about to come back and make a statement. So the Koreans can fight their asses off, man. And I think that Duho Choi is no exception. I know that he's never you know been in there with anyone like Jeremy and this and that, even though Cub, Cub Swanson beat Jeremy too. But look, the bottom line here is that I don't think any of that shit matters. I think it's all about the fight at hand. And I think that Duho is smart enough to game plan to beat a guy like Jeremy Stevens. Now, look, if I'm wrong and Jeremy comes out here and bruises him and, you know, gets all, you know, vetty and gritty with him, then, hey, man, you know, Jeremy's the fucking man. I got so much respect for Jeremy Stevens. But the more I think about it, I do think the precise pinpoint striking of Duho Choi is going to be the difference. And I see him winning a five-round decision here, Shaq. Now, before we uh, hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute, I I think it's time to run that promo. So, uh, listen, guys, if you want our bets for this card or for any future UFC card, you go to bestfightpicks.com, go to maxbetseason.com. Between Shaq and I, we have over 100 units of profit, and we're out here giving underdogs and slight favorites, no chalk, no bullshit. So if you want to join the winning team, you know what you got to do. Now let's hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. And joining us now on the Big Marley Minute is Big Marley himself. Big Marley, Happy New Year, man. You ready to do some damage on DraftKings this year? Absolutely. Let's make 2018 a great year. So, man, I got to ask you off the top. Who do you think are going to be the most owned fighters You know, for this weekend's DraftKings? I mean, I would have to assume Uriah Hall is going to be very popular. Uh, what are you thinking? Uh, I think Usman will be the most popular, followed by the main event. 
Um, I'm guessing Choi will bro- uh, probably be a little bit more popular, but Stevens would be my third highest on, I think. Now, uh, you got an opinion on this uh, Alex White and James Krause fight? Because, look, Alex White came through last time. This is a completely different matchup, but uh, he could be a sneaky underdog here. Yeah, he is a sneaky underdog, and uh, he's definitely in play uh, on DraftKings. He is 7,800, and Krause is 8,400. Uh, so if you're going to go with the mid-range approach, I, I don't really want a whole lot of uh, these chick fights. So this is the fight I think you need someone from if you're doing the mid-range. Um, and I, I guess I would prefer to go down to White. I think he is more likely to finish. I think uh, if Krause wins, he's probably going to beat him in a decision uh, and just take his time, kind of picking him apart on the feet. Uh, but White, is he's got more power. Uh, he's been looking pretty good recently. So you got to find the dog somewhere. I think I'm going to have a few shots at White. But Krause is also in play. So I like both sides. But if I had to make one lineup, uh, I think I'd prefer White. So out of all the chalk we talked about, the heavily owned guys, the Uriah Halls, the Usmans, even the main event, are you looking to have any of them on your lineup as well, or are you trying to fade that completely? Yeah, I mean, I think for me it's going to kind of be a Stars and Stro- uh, Scrubs kind of kind of lineup approach, um, and I like all those people at the top. So in order to get them, i got to find at least uh, two low-priced dogs or three higher-priced dogs. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is kind of get in a mixture of two of these high prices. I don't know, Usman maybe, and Hall, it's just hard to fit them both. But yeah, I like, uh, I like them and I think they should pay off their salary. It's just with Usman, he's got to be the highest scoring fighter because he is 9,400. Uh, but he's got the potential to do it. He's a minus 650 favorite. He's the safest guy on the card. Um, I think he's probably a lock in cash games if you can afford him. But that's the only problem is affording him. So I know you got a very good read on Michael Johnson's fights. You've called them really well in the past, and uh, I have to assume that on both these guys' best days, Darren Elkins and Michael Johnson, they're both they both got to be high point scorers. You leaning a certain way here? Uh, I think this is another shot. I'd rather just go with the dog. Um, if I'm finding, if I got to use three dogs, um, I don't mind White and Elkins being two of them. Uh, he's scrappy, he's a grinder, I could see him getting it done late, but he is going against a guy who's way more athletic, but he's, I mean, Johnson's going to one down to 145 for the first time, so I don't know how that's going to go. If he gasses late, we know that Elkins won't, so I would rather just take the shot on the dog and one. So two favorites I think are going to win are Kyung Ho Kang and Zach Cummings. Now, are you in agreement with me, like, not just that they're going to win, but that they could potentially score a lot of points here with dominant performances and maybe even a finish? Yeah, I can see that. Um, with Kang, he's the second highest priced guy, so it's really do you want to pick him over Usman and Hall, or are you going to pair him with one of those two kind of thing? Uh, so I don't think I'm going to have a whole lot of them, but I do have interest. Uh, the layoff scares me a bit, but I don't think I'm going to have any uh, Guido Canetti, so Kang's my only guy I like in that fight. But Cummings I have less interest in. I would almost rather go Alves as another dog option if I'm not going with White or... Elkins, uh, you get Alves at 7,400, uh, and that just affords so much of those other top guys. So if I'm making some punts, I don't hate Alves. I'd rather go with him over Cummings. So last but not least, I need uh, the big Marley perspective on this main event, man, because, look, Duho Choi has a lot of hype, but we haven't really seen him in there with anyone except Cub Swanson back in 2016. And Jeremy Stevens, he has the most losses in UFC history, but he's also been in there with literally everyone. So what are you thinking? Um, I like Duho Choi. I mean, this kid's super good. Uh, it's just if he's going to get tagged like you get tagged against Swanson, I don't see him making it to a decision. So I think this is a stack and cash type of fight. Get your exposure to both guys there um, and then take shots on both of them in GPPs. If I'm making 10 lineups, I want this fight in all 10, I think. Maybe 60% Duho Choi, 40% Steven, something like that. But the winner should score high, and uh, neither one of them are super high priced. So I think you got to have high exposure to this. Um, uh, my pick is Duho Choi, though. So, Kyle, before I let you go, man, the fans can follow you at Big Marley 3, but let them know about uh, your new uh, DFS Army promotion you got going on, that 10% off with the code Sleeveless. Hell yeah, uh, you said it. DFS Army, I'm working over there now doing NFL content. You can find my article. I'll have it out today. 
Um, but we also have all sports. We got NBA. They've been killing it lately. We got MMA. We got everything. So whatever you're into, we got it. And you can save 10% every month by using my promo code sleeveless. Yes, sir. And if you do sign up, make sure you let Kyle know your username that you heard to sign up from half the battle and you'll get a free bet. So Kyle, man, we're going to speak next week and, uh, man, it's a, let's kick this new year off in style. Let's do it. Good luck. And that's once again, why Kyle Marley is the DraftKings correspondent for half the battle. I mean, the dude killed it all last year. I know he's going to kill it all this year. And, uh, you know, by this time next year, man, I think he might be the president of DraftKings. I mean, when you're getting the best MMA picks at a very good rate and you're getting DraftKings advice, I mean, what can you say? Show me better body shooting <laughs> in the history of the game. You know what I mean? But, uh, Shaq, we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC St. Louis? My fight to watch is going to be Zach Cummings versus Tiago Alves. This is a big fight for Zach Cummings. If he can win this fight, this will be the first solid name on his resume. He's pulled off some big upsets in the past. And uh, Tiago, this is another crossroads fight for him. He loses this fight. I mean, Tiago's pretty much done anyways. But for Cummings specifically, this is a big fight. If he wins this fight, he, he will be probably lined up for something big uh, in his next fight. Yeah, and look, that's a great fight, but my fight to watch is 100% James Krause versus Alex White. Look, this is a crossroads fight for both fighters, like we mentioned earlier on the show. And the winner of this, look, if Krause wins this fight, he's probably going to retire, sail off into the sunset, go out, go out on a big win. But if Alex White wins this fight, he's going to get the biggest name win of his UFC career. He's going to get on his first win streak in the UFC. And getting a win over a guy like James Krause, that's going to propel you to that next step. That's going to get you a top 25 opponent. That's going to get him back in the conversation with the OAMs, with the Tony Martins, who we already fought. But that's going to get him back to fighting someone like that. So for that reason, Shaq, Alex White versus James Krause is my fight to watch. So Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC SDL? My fighter to watch is going to be Kalindra Faria. I mean, she's got the opportunity of a lifetime, a very favorable uh, fight, in my opinion. Um, her, the way her first fight went, she took the loss well. Now she's got the opportunity to go in there, do what you've always set out to do when you first started this. Get your first UFC win, go in there, and punk this girl out. Yeah, I 100% agree with you, man. And, you know, when you see plus 100 against Jessica, I mean, come on. But, look, my fighter to watch is Jessica Rose Clark. You know, a lot of people don't know who she is. A lot of people think she's being brought in to lose, the feet of this hype train. But you and I both know, uh, Paige Van Zandt uh, took this fight without consulting her management. I don't think the, uh, the UFC, I don't think the UFC is on this hype train anymore. And look, like I said, Paige Van Zandt took this fight without consulting her yeah. management. And if it were up to and, them, they wouldn't have taken that fight. Speaking of Paige Van Zandt, you know, she pulled out of the Jessica I fight when she claimed that she had ring ringworm and uh, I don't back about injury, all that. you know, all this stuff. And then then she comes out a couple weeks later after pulling out that fight and says, my next fight will be against the winner of the uh, Ultimate Fighter show. And then Dana comes back and says, no, it's uh, not. No, it's not. I don't know who told her that. So uh, I don't think they're on the hype train anymore. Well, I, I do think they are because, I mean, Paige Trans-Ant opened minus 175. Yes, I know the line flipped, and rightfully so, but still, man, she's in, she she's, you know, she's, uh, well, actually in the, in the article is minus 175, but once it came to the book, yeah. But look, bottom line here, what I'm trying to get at is that she's still on the main card. People are still promoting her. She's on the poster. She's still a big part of this card, and no one knows who Jessica Rose Clark is, but this is that opportunity to come in here, steal all that hype, Get the biggest name win of your career. Get two two UFC wins in a row, and you know finally rid of rid us of this fucking Paige Van Zandt bullshit once and for all. So for that reason, my fighter to watch is Jessica Rose Clark. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down this Sunday. Fox Sports One, UFC STL, Duho Choi versus Jeremy Stevens. And man, the fans can follow you at MMA Genius 5 Shaq, any message for them before we go? Guys, you got to get up on these packages. You guys know we're going to get these wins for you. We got this week, and next weekend's a big weekend. We got two cards next weekend, Bellator 192, Lima vs. Rory, and then we got UFC 220. Some big fights on that card. Already looking at a few spots. You know, when I say easy money, it's easy money. So 
uh, sign up for these packages, guys. And let's just say Max Bet season is right around the corner. And one thing I really love about our new service is that, you know, it's not just about them paying us for bets. This is about, man, I mean, look, it's long term. But what I like the most about this is I've been in direct contact with all our players. You know, we speak personally on the phone. And that that's what I like about this. I like personally helping people, working directly with them closely and trying to fine tune those details. So they take those fucking 1% ROIs and turn them into 30% ROIs. So that's that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to help the community. So if you want to jump on board the, the money train, you know exactly what you got to do. Bestfightpicks.com, maxbetseason.com. Long term, the results speak for themselves. So make sure you follow me on Twitter at bestfightpicks. Go to bestfightpicks.com for the plays. Maxbetseason.com for the plays. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. Hook up those five-star reviews on iTunes. Shaq and I will be back next week for two cards. Bellator, Rory versus Lima. And UFC 220, Miocic versus Ngannou. So until the next time, let's cash these bets.